Ready to go back? <coughs> you as my students. What I always do to get the attention is... <laughs> it works wonderfully. Okay. Now, you had lunch. You probably didn't think about the practice and what we've done so far at all, but who knows? Do you still have questions about how to convince your patients to come along and do the... Or should I move on? Ah, there. Yeah. Um, so you were worrying that... Can you repeat the question? So you were discussing what if there is a comorbidity with PTSD? We were discussing what the for PTSD and we were wondering is PTSD for PTSD and is it possible for them to go along? Yeah, uh, I, for PTSD I would use more or less the same thing, how to convince them to do it. So I would ask them, what do you think happens if you really intensely have to think about your trauma again? And then I would get all the worries, what might happen if they have to do it again, never get out or whatever. Is it possible to uh, be diagnosed with both? Yes, sure. You can have both. Yeah, PTSD, it, it's not, um, but I'm biased. Um, we don't have that much um, trauma because um, no wars and um, hardly any natural disasters. Car so accidents. Car accidents. So for us it's car accidents and rape. rape. Rape is everywhere. There's no difference about that. But it, may, it still makes, number-wise, makes it less, less, luckily somewhat less likely to get PTSD because we have a less occurrence of trauma, but not for rape. But now we have those kind of patients and you can do both. And, it, yeah. And you also do the exposure similarly, although there are differences. So the exposure in uh, Zenzo that I'm now going to present, I will show you what we do for GAD. But you do something very similar with PTSD and even more similar with complicated grief. I think has more overlap almost with GAD than it has with PTSD. Or it's in between. And you can also, although once in a while, it can be something that's really handy to do with social anxiety. So think about it as an option because you cannot do all. I, I mean, I do rather do nasty things with my social phobic um, subjects, like taking Fifi into the town. I guess most of you know that you have a little brush where you clean the floor with, you put it on a leash and you pretend this is your dog and then you walk through the town. If you haven't done it, do it. It's much, lots of fun. <laughs> it really is lots and lots of fun. Just the reaction as you take Fifi and do I have to wait for Fiffy? Come, Fiffy, and then see what happens. It's something that social phobics do not like to do, as you might imagine. It's like part of the experiment about being uh, hospitalized by the psychiatrist. Yeah. <laughs> It never happens, but that's what they're afraid of. But never ever, as on this, really never ever the police has come. Once in a while things have gone wrong and we had the police come along, but never for Fifi. And we have had some very lovely experiences. Never forget a small, small boy came and said, can I pet him? <laughs> So what happens if you do that? I, I, would get, I would recommend try it. But if you don't dare to try it, what happens is that 80% um, of the people will do as if you aren't there because they don't want to get involved with that crazy people or whatever's going on there. And to, um, some think that maybe where's the camera? You know, what's going on? And a small portion thinks, this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into it. But the idea that actually you will be get to psychiatry and people will talk to you and things will get nasty, that never happens. Um, but then social phobics can be very much afraid of mucking up a presentation with a boss or something else. And that's something you can practice with them not how not to do it. But what about all the worries that they could do it? And then 
uh, exposure in the sense so that I'm now presenting is an option. So I also do it once in a while with social anxious patients because it's just something that adds nicely for those kind of places where doing the exposure would really be too costly, you know. So that's the, these are the options. Other questions about the rationale or fine, super. So, now, our patients have agreed to do exposure with us. What are the next steps? Um, choose a worry and do not be too picky about it. I usually do not do hierarchies and, and pick something. I choose something where I think, what's my first worry? I choose something that is really unpleasant but not death yet for the very first time and something where I think you can picture it nicely and something if we then write a scenario I'd rather have it that it's that the person is really involved in the things that are happening so you could imagine your husband having an accident but like a movie you know you he, you are not with him I'd rather have a scene in the beginning where you're in there but that's it um, Funnily enough, those of you who have experience with exposure and agoraphobia and panic, in agoraphobia and panic, I block two hours to give the rationale because there's where I get all the um, reactants. As, as soon as, a, as someone with a panic sees where, where I'm trying to take them, they come up with, I'll die. And if they really don't like you, they would tell them, I would commit suicide. I would kill myself, so everything so that I don't dare to do that with them. So I take, lot, take two hours, I, I block two sessions to convince them. And once I then start with the exposure, it usually goes fine without too much trouble. Whereas in GAD, it's rather simple to convince them to do it because they don't have such clear, I, my explanation is that they do not have such a clear idea what it means. But once you start working with them on a worry to come up with a gruesome worry scenario, it's exposure. There's no way around it. Even if they help you to create the scene, they have to expose themselves and it's very unpleasant and it can take much longer. So there is the time I might block time with my patients. And one of the strategies they have to avoid getting into it, to avoid thinking and going into death, and you have to always be careful because their thinking is highly automatic, so they chain and switch focus very easily without any bad intent. But on the other hand, it is also a very good strategy to avoid doing the worry exposure. So they come up with, this is not the perfect worry, and I could be worse, or it could be more this, or this is not the most important. So they switch the focus all the time. And that's why I say just pick one the content isn't important. Important is that they get emotional. So you pick any worry. You think they will get emotional and if they start to say probably it's not the right one, you say, well, let's stick with this one and then try another one later. Don't give them too, too much wiggle room out of it, if I may say so. There was a hand somewhere. Someone had a question. I forgot who probably gone and otherwise you ask me later on. And then we actually do write and there are different ways and I'm not sure what is the best way but the way how we do it and people I train do it, we write it down with them the scenario because the problem is in um, with imaginary exposure I guess that most of you have done a relaxation or some imagery in relaxation, you know? And you were supposed to go to a nice place and all of a sudden I would say, and the wood was looking so lovely today and half of you were at the sea. And that's highly irritating that you had pictures that don't fit. And that usually gets you out of the, the, the experience. If you first write it down, it's agreed and there's no surprise why you do it. The disadvantage is that it's the first exposure is already writing that scenario together. The advantage is that they are much more willing, once you really do the exposure, to get into the scene because they can trust you that you will not surprise them 
that they will not all of a sudden a child will die or something else will happen, they know it. And that makes it easier to stay in because even with goodwill you know how easily our concentration is broken and we get out of those imaginary scenarios. So I find it more, I take the disadvantage of having them prepared with the advantage that they really do the exposure with me and that it fits. And then I say, and if it's not perfect, we will rewrite it, but again, we do it together. So I give a lot of the control to the patient. With my help and the goal to make it worse and worse, we will simply rewrite it if it doesn't work. But f I do not digress from what we have been written, write, writing down. Um, it's a bit technical, but if you do Im imagery, there are two different ways to think about it, and we combine both. But one is the similar script. So let me see what I do have here. It's, I enter the office of my dentist, the tooth with a great cavity needs to be filled, the typical smell of my dentist office enters my nostrils. While I'm getting on the dentist chair, the instruments are laid out for me, the chair is lifted so I can see clearly. Stimulus script gives the environment visual, smell, auditory and maybe tactile. So I feel a chair, I see something, those kind of things. And another part that's also, ah oh, damn it, um, important, so don't forget it, and that's why I tear them apart, is the response script. The response script is about the reaction I have to those things that I see. I enter the office of my dentist, a tooth with a great cavity needs to be filled, with a pounding heart. So this is my response to being there. And a little shaky, I'm getting on the chair. Um, with damp hands, the damp hands is my reaction. So. Um, a good script has both sides to it. The stimuli, and with stimuli, think not only of visual, think about taste, hear, feel, and the response. The response can be a bit tricky because um, patients might not know how they respond, you know. You can take care of this by um, open questions or instructions. So I would say, well, you're sitting in the dentist chair. What do you feel right now? What is your heart doing? Yeah? So watch your body. You don't always have to give it, but don't leave it out because this is how they, you bring them towards the emotion and to recognize that they have emotion and that the emotions are intense. You want this part in there. So if you write this down, that is, is a part of what you do. Um, helpful questions is um, what would happen, sure, and always go for the worst. What would make it worse? What would be the next step that would really, yeah, would happen after? What would you see, smell, hear? What kind of symptoms do you experience? What kind of thoughts cross your mind? So this um, encompasses it. So it's half past two. We do still have enough time. I would really, really love for you to try to write such a scenario. 15 minutes is enough. And then I would like to hear those examples because once you read them to me, I can show you where things go wrong. It's way more complicated if I try to tell you all the ins and outs how such a scenario could be done. So please, get together, write a very scenario about whatever you want. And it's okay if you have keywords. It doesn't have all be, you know, it's not literacy that we are, go liter literature we are going for. We are going for the gist. And then, when we come back, give me your examples. And that, then I can provide you with feedback that will give you really an idea what should be in, or is it a good ending, or is it the right way, and am I going to the right direction? I have found that this is the, most, the best way to teach you to do it, instead of telling it, trying to make a checklist. So, about 15 minutes. Then we come back here, be a bit sadistic, Think about people losing their jobs, their homes, 
you can take the, the I could easily do a scenario on the Syrian war before I leave on Sunday. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> the German has its own worries right yeah, it's now. Getting shot out of the air. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I brought my dog, you know, we will not get on any plane because the dog is there. Okay, forget it. Um, have fun. F 15 minutes back. So, who would be willing to put up his script ideas so that we can discuss it? <coughs> Super. Yes. I can project as well. Oh. <laughs> okay. Do you need any background or just... No, go. Okay. okay. Um, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. I just had my coffee at work. The phone rings. The secretary of the boss asks me to come and see um, him. With a pounding heart, trembling, fingers, dry mouth, and stomach churning, I walk into his office. I'm feeling highly panicked. I'm afraid my worst fear will come true. I enter the room. With a stern face, he says, sit down. He hardly looks at me. He says, I will cut a long story short. I hear my heart beating. I smell the, um, the cologne from him, and I feel I'm choking. To our regret, because of changes in the company, we have to let you go. According to the contract, you get one month's salary. Please, after you leave the room, return to your office, take all your personal belongings, go then to the secretary to fill the paperwork, and we wish you luck in your future plans. I feel devastated, desperate, and hopeless, worthless. I feel dizzy and nauseous. I get up, but I feel that my legs are not carrying me. I will never get another job. I can't, I won't have money. I will be homeless. I have an image of myself on the street begging for money and I think I won't kill myself. Okay. I think mine, is it? At least makes noise, huh? So for everyone, what did you like about it? Of course it's a nice one. So what do you think was really well done? Where do you probably have doubts? What she failed to physiological reactions. That was nice, eh? so there was nice response in there. I also thought it was nicely focused, huh? Nice. Nicely focused. You know, no meandering about. Other things you liked or things you thought it's probably not so good. Any ideas? Okay, what I was a bit doubtful about was the ending. The, I really loved that you were going into those cognitions because they are important. So this is really nice about the scenario. But I thought they were a bit all over the place. Who is the patient? It's my patient. Um, I just was, I'm, I'm the therapist, you're the patient, okay? Um, I was just wondering, what is the worst about losing the job for you? I'll never find another job. I might be homeless. Yeah. Nobody will care. Take care of me. Yeah. It's nothing. It's it's the end of life. Okay. There's nothing beyond. Okay, so the end of life, is it the end of life because of the financial things gone? What is really bad? Or is it the end of life because you think you're worthless or because you will become lonely. What is the thing that is, everything is worrying, but it, what is really triggering your worry most? Right now I'm afraid that I, I don't have no, no money to, to, to live. To live. So really this, this being destitute. Yeah, yeah. I think so, yeah. 
the destitute. Okay, if you would elaborate on that, if you would give it a bit more time, like you go back to your desk before you clear it off and you have time to think about what it means to you, what should we write in there? What should we? What would she write in write in our script? You know, what would be the essence of this feeling of destitution or no money? You know, what? I, I guess without without money, uh, I'm worthless. Uh, I have no future, no yeah. self-esteem, nothing. Yeah. So if you would sit there and you would really think, uh, I'm worthless. Without a job, I'm I'm a nothing. No one would think highly of me. Or what would be your thoughts? Yeah. Uh, my friends will desert me. Okay. I will never have uh, a romantic partner. Okay. So um, all those kind of things. So you're sitting there, and it's is the loneliness, the worthlessness, the worst part, or is it losing your home? What is what? We can do two scenarios with two different endings. But if you now would have to pick, what is the worst one, worst aspect of it? I would say losing of uh, way of living. <coughs> Okay, okay. So you get an idea what I want. In the end, I thought it was almost like a worry chain. You know, it's that yeah. being lonely and being worthless and being homeless and so many more things. You probably want to write your own scenario. I would like to concentrate. I t try to take the heat out by saying we can write another one. But for now, what would be the worst thing you would now think about? So I try to hone in on one aspect, and then I would take more time. If she would have a hard time to decide, I would probably elaborate two and then pick one. But I would not put so many thoughts. Because otherwise, I thought it was a really nice one. Stimulus was in, response was in. So as a, as a theme going super. Also, I loved it that you had the, the cognitive schema tells, oh, what does it mean in there? Because a lot of people forget it. I really loved that. But that there was too much in there. So I would hone on on this. And I would also say, well, you know, we don't have to you don't have to pick the best one, but let's take, pick one and then we do another s scenario where we pick on the other one. You know, with the homelessness we could do a scenario where we really are homeless and we imagine that, if that is an important one. So try not to put too much in it, but to get to the meaning. Does that, I hope that helps, so that gives you an idea how, how I would do it and I think you did a wonderful job. Would someone else like to, to, to give his scenario and so we can see what works or not works not so well. We have a question yeah? that uh, came out. Came hmm? out. Um, would you? Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I take this noisy thing. My patient. Yeah. She gave uh, quite hard the uh, scenario, mm -hmm. and uh, we were uh, thinking uh, if, uh, if the, it's one of the first exposures, and we didn't meant to be so hard. Mm -hmm. What are we supposed to do? I mean, uh, we supposed to pick up uh, one element and, uh, and and ask more about it, not the worst, or, okay. or touch the worst, and then. Who was the patient? Okay, and what may I ask? What was the scenario? Was it death? Uh, the scenario was that uh, I uh, have a phone call that my youngest daughter got in a car accident. Okay. Okay, and um, yeah, Th that is a tricky one if it's the very first one, you know. Um, so uh, it's a good question. Oh, so you have your. What is the thing you f fear most? That they tell you that she's dead. No, so that she is, will be crippled. Okay. Okay. What would be the the for you the most awful moment? The moment you hear that she will be crippled, or the moment, for example, where you are in the hospital and see her and know she will never be fine again, or even probably the moment where she would be out of hospital in a wheelchair or. Maybe she can't even leave hospital. So what would be your ideas? What would be the worst? The worst uh, feeling? The moment. The moment we would want to catch and hone on on. The moment where you hear that or the moment where you see it in the hospital. So what would be a moment that would trigger really intense emotions? The, the moment that uh, 
take the most emotions if the first uh, note is. Okay. So when you when you've been told. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I guess it wouldn't be the moment where someone phones, but where you are at the hospital and some doctor would inform you. What do you think? I mean, that would the moment where someone would tell you that she will probably never be okay again. Or is or am I wrong? I, can you repeat what you asked? I was asking that probably you will really get the bad news when you are at the hospital. Yes. Yeah. But uh, when I have the phone call, it's like all my worries has been fulfilled. I've come through. Okay. There. Yeah, well, then we have picked a really nice moment. Okay. Then we are with the right. So you see, I try to find out. Thank you. I, I try to find out what is the, the moment that they really are afraid of, and if I think what I don't do here, but if I think they're actually giving me a lesser one because they don't want to get into the worst ones, I don't really push it the first time. I take the lesser one, and then we will build on that for another scenario. But you see the way how I ask, I ask what would trigger the most emotion, what is the moment, the helplessness when you sit beside your daughter, the moment you hear it, the moment she's home and you can't help her, whatever, you know, what would... And as you can also see, I do offer quite a lot of pictures already, at least I hope you see that, in a way that is leading, but since GAD patients have such a hard time to imagine things, it can be very helpful if you, I try to offer a lot then so that I'm not too much leading. But I do offer those examples so that they get an idea where I want to go to and that helps them, especially in the beginning, because they're usually not used to think in those kind of pictures or scenarios. And that's why I am quite a bit leading and try to be not too much by giving several options and then honing down on that. But I do that, so it's, I think it's also good to s you see that as my style. Yeah? The patient is going to the patient is going to repeat this scenario over and over again, like That's 20, 30 minutes. If so, then if like the story that we heard before, that there's a, a beginning which is lower key, and then it gets to the yeah. to, the, to, the, to the, the pinnacle, and then if we go over it again, she's going to go back to the to the lower set. She keeps going up and down. Is that what we want to accomplish, or do we want to have the you the want to see going into his mouth. Okay, let's say the, yeah. The, I tried. I try to keep the introduction as short as possible, but for the first time, usually needed to get the setting and get people in, and to keep much more time on the later one. And so, when we talk about the next steps, what I do is I also work with a lot of breaks. Stay in this emotion. Stay in that situation without giving much or just repeating the last sentence. So now you sit on your desk, you've lost your job. So I'm not, not putting new things in, but I repeat old things and I give them lots of breaks so that they can get into it. Yes? And then I put it on, a, we record it. Everyone now has smartphones. Our life has become so much easier. So these sessions are recorded. And if I'm lucky, I usually block time to do that. I do it twice with them, we pick the better one, the better recording, and that one she, she or, her, or he takes home and then they listen to it repeatedly at home and that does the trick. You usually, if you think, and it's even the question if it is at all habituation, if we think about the mechanisms, I'm not going to go there right now, it's kind of extinction learning and it's really cognitive restructuring. In GAD, it's about the repetition at home, to daring to do it again and again, where you get a lessening of the effect by whatever means. So that is important. Uh, what I usually tell them is that it's better not to listen every day once, but to listen twice or even three times. And then I prefer that set it by uh, away two or three days where they do that, where they listen two or three times and record it. And usually the scenario is about 10 minutes? Ah, uh, yeah, between 10 and 20, if I'm really lucky, but most are between 10 and 15 minutes. With the breaks, you know, and they are on the tape. There's not much I can do at the beginning. But later on, they can also tell the stories to themselves. So they don't need the recording, per se, if they become practice. So that's essentially the PE protocol. It is? Yeah, you can use it. It's just for how do you do it with GAD. No, I have not invented something totally new. But with PE, you look for the hotspots. You don't really have hotspots here. So you look for the schema tasks, like I'm worthless, I'm, 
I'm, I'm useless, I'm dependent, I'm unskilled. So it's different themes from PE, you know? But the rest is very similar. It's also very similar if you do complicated grief. The big challenge is they have never done that before. It's totally tough to write the first scenarios. It's something I cannot prepare you for because this is really the challenge. They are all over the place. That is really the more difficult one than actually than the exposure. Whereas with trauma, you're with PE, with, if you think about or with grief, you know what, where you have to go. With GAD, you, the path is way less clear, but the techniques are very similar. Yeah. Yeah? Is, is, there, is there a recording? Hmm? I hate it. Is the recording of the therapist or the patient reading the script? It's of, I, I record when I read the script. That's the easiest way because then I can simply do it while we do it in ter therapy session anyway and they can take this home. And later on they are supposed to write their own scripts, you know, and then take them home and do it themselves. And that's also why I usually say you are and not I am, because for me that feels kind of artificial to say I am waiting for the call, phone call. If I read it, I usually say you. There isn't much really hard evidence you can do both. It's just my feeling. But if they do it, they are supposed to say I. You know, if it's in their voice and they say it, it should be I am waiting for the phone to call. And I know that colleagues of mine do it from, with I from the beginning and also have good success. That doesn't seem to make the difference. How many sessions, what's the average of Yeah, I get a lot of questions how we go on further. I have slides for that. So we, you know, so right now, I know it's step by step, but how am, so right now it's about writing the scenario. Writing the scenario. Do you have questions or other things you now that you we've gone through through examples? Is it clear how to write it, or do you still have questions? Yeah. Still, it's not not completely clear. What would be the worst regarding what about what? Where? How do worst? I get the most emotional response? What would you make feel really terrible? In GAD, I want to expose them to emotion. What would make you intensely unhappy, intensely anxious, intensely bad feeling? When you think about yeah, when you think about it in this situation, what triggers which aspect of the situation? Yeah, what what aspect of the okay. situation gets really gets to you? Really, really gets to you, scares you, or you frightened of, or yeah. In the end, we always ask them to go where they do not want to go. <laughs> that's, the, that's the tough part. Other questions or comments? OK. Thanks. OK. So um, we did that. And we've already started on that. What I then do, I usually almost always make, do a double hour when I really then do the exposure. Something that I think might be very helpful information for you about writing the script is that it's not unusual to take two or three sessions to write it. So if you think you're writing a script in one session, you are very lucky if that works out. So do not get nervous because GADs are all over the place. You know, different ending, cannot decide, really don't know. It's so, it's so aversive for them that they, and it's so unusual for them, two things coming together. I mean, it's not just bad will, it's also just how am I supposed to do that, that we usually take two to three sessions to write our first scenario, one scenario. Um, you're much faster if you do that with PTSD because you know what it's about. If you take more than three sessions, something is weird, okay? Avoidance. Then usually there is avoidance. Then there is something you have to see. 
One thing, we have def different options if you think you encounter avoidance. You can go about it cognitively. You, did they get it? What are they afraid of? You can also say, well, you know what? I would like to switch our worry topic. I would like you to do with me a worry scenario of what could happen if you do a worry scenario. Um, so what is the worst that could happen if you do that with me? And that's also a way just to find out what they think. They will cry, they will um, throw up, uh, they will throw a scene, um, they can't stand it. Just another way to do it. Both actually are the both. So just as a tip, it's not unusual not to do it in one session. Two is fine, three is still fine, four is getting for me into a doubtful range. You know, depends. You can also have someone who's so unused to think or think through that it's really not bad will, but ability that make it difficult. But there could be another element, so just watch out for it. Okay, then you have this one scenario, then you block an up time, because I would like to repeat it two or three times in this one and a half hour that, and that I then get if I have two therapy sessions back by se back. By back. So I do the first worry exposure, reading the script, taking lots of breaks. Quite often I also um, tell them about that they should raise their fingers um, if they uh, find, if the emotion is really there. Because then I want them to stay there, so I will prolong it. So if you raise the finger, I'm, you know, my boss just told me, I would say, uh, he just told you, you will lose your job. Stay with your emotion. What do you feel right now? What's going on in your body? How does it feel that he told you, you just lost your job? Okay, so I give them time. So the signal is not to go on, the signal is a sign to stay. And quite often I ask them to close their eyes while doing it. I do not a long expo uh, ex relaxation because we don't want relaxation. Tell them to, to close their eyes, getting as comfortable as they can get. If they're really uncomfortable with, with um, closed eyes, they don't have to, although it makes life easier. Then try to position them that there isn't too much to see wherever they look at. Okay. The important part is afterwards discussion of the very exposure. What where will you show that you are really happy? What will you reward in a worry exposure? Let me put it in learning terms. Feeling? Yeah, if they allowed feeling and if they got anxious and if they are crying. It sounds a bit bad, but I say, this is so great. I know it feels awful, but it's so great. Look, you did such a wonderful job. I'm really proud of you. Um, and I always have to watch a little bit, my socialization is American. And so I do change my personality a little bit, not as much anymore, but when I was in America and I did my first treatment there, I said, oh, you did a very good job. For Germans, this is, believe me, high praise. <laughs> you know? Normal would be, you did a good job, or not too bad. Oh yeah, this, this will do. This is German praise. And this German praise will work in German therapy. Better actually than, oh, you are marvelous. But in America, I did that with social phobics, you can't expect the reaction. I was so bad. I'm so sorry. And I said, no, you, you did a good job. Didn't work. So my American... Um, persona was then, oh, marvelous, unbelievable, you can be so proud of yourself. <laughs> no. What's worse here? What's worse here? Because it's unbelievable, you know, so I always have to watch out. I'm not so, uh, the, it, I, my impression of the Israeli is, you are more like the Germans. We get along pretty fine. Straight, don't overdo it, play it cool a bit, you know, so that's probably because one of the things why I really liked it here. I thought communication was very simple. You get what you get, what you get. Perfect. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> 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 yeah, I, so I thought 
great, you know, but you have, so if I'm now giving feedback that I said it's wonderful, that's more my American personal, you have to fit it to the Israeli context. But the important thing is, you are delighted by their tears, by their anxiety, by getting into it. If they say, this wasn't so bad, you actually think, well, and you also say, well, well, I'm really glad that you got through it, but we wanted to make it bad. So do you think we did a good job? <laughs> you know, you orient them towards a good job is feeling bad. A good job is also getting through. So don't make it bad to say, well, you know, although I think that's wonderful, but if it wasn't so bad, I'm not sure we did what we were supposed to do. So what do we have to do? So the discussion afterwards is a lot focused on you did wonderfully if you let the emotions there. Do we have the, to change the scenario to make it worse? Not easier, worse. So are there parts that didn't work or did work? And, 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 and not being too delighted. That if, it shouldn't have been easy. It's great if they did it. And they probably thought it would be worse because they have, probably have expectations. So that's also not too bad, but it should hurt, then they have done a good job. So we've done it the first time, we've discussed it, uh, also discussed it, how does it feel to have this emotion, how does it feel to the next one, and then I do the next one, and I really want to do at least two, if not three times. And I might change things if they say that this, this didn't work, or all of a sudden I thought this would not be my reaction, and then we can get rid of it. So a little bit of rewriting, not too much, a little bit is fine. I have to admit, just one moment, that the, usually where things really go wrong, and I do not have a solution for that, is when they just start to laugh. And you have some of them to do. It's luckily really a small part, but they just think it's funny. And that is avoidance. They step out and they put it into humor. And you, ha try, you have to try to help them not to do that. But that is a tough one. These were the ones where we once in a while really failed. And that was usually not those that were too anxious. It was those that really just put, thought it was all hilarious. Or that was their reaction. So try. That's, that's usually is avoidance if they start to find it funny. And I do not have an easy answer for that. So what, do do? what do you do? I say, well, I, I go to a meter level. Why did you laugh? But why do you think you laughed? And is it possible that then it's less painful? Could you get there? Can, we can I help you to get there? And, uh, but some of them don't. But that is how you do. You go on the meter. Yeah? Just, I was going to say something like different. I've actually had some success with saying something to people like, you know, some people, when they start to get really uncomfortable, they laugh. Good job. Keep laughing. Let it go. Let that feeling come. And just encouraging, turning oh. it around. If the laughing is a sign that you're starting to feel, great. This is great. And, 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 the, and it has actually happened huh? that sometimes the laughing gets into the, and then they'll start crying. Ah, that is a very nice idea. Thank you. Yeah, like that one. Paradoxical. And on the other hand, if you predict it, as usually if what you predict is less likely to happen, and if it happens, it's not a catastrophe. It's also like true, that. Because yeah. some people, laughter is the type of bad reaction. Yeah. 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 Like that. It's a discharge. I will keep that. Did you, did, you, did you record this first reading with the discussion? Not the discussion, but the first reading. Yeah, I record. I, record. I usually tr encourage my patient to record any session anyway. We all know that research that if you are prescribed medication, and that's not much information, no? how to take your medication, you ask people 10 minutes later, they don't know. Our idea that we talk to patients for 45 minutes and they will know all the major points we've made is pure illusion, sorry. And so it's very good to do that. And so a standard homework is listen once again and come back with questions. I also like that because that then they have more time. If they're emotionally very involved, they might not come up with the questions that are important. So I love to have the sessions recorded anyway and ask them to listen to it again. And maybe I've overlooked something, not explained something well, or whatever. Um, some of you, I'm sure, know Yalom. Um, Yalom, yeah. Uh, Irvin Yalom, and he wrote this nice book, I think it's Travel with Paula or something like that. 
he by chance discovered that his patient was also writing up her therapy. He did and they did and they discovered it after half of the session and then they made a book out of it. And it's, uh, he's a good writer so it's lovely to read. But what's also very apparent is that whenever he thinks, ha, nothing is in her diary. <laughs> you know, this now we have the, the point, the hot spot. Usually it's not there. And also those things that where he thinks she, she doesn't. If I remember correctly, it was not totally politically correct. He thought she was overweight and she also thought she was overweight, but that would never be an issue. He would not think of someone that he's overweight and she would say, he doesn't even look at me. He thinks I'm too fat. He doesn't want to see that, you know. I'm, it was an issue. He didn't bring it up. The patient saw it. So it can be interesting to, to do that. Yeah? One of the things that I've encountered that's very challenging is with uh, the avoiding clients, they'll say something like, it doesn't bother me because I know it's not real. Yeah. It's not real. Of course, if it would happen, I would feel bad, but I can think about anything. And do they still react after the exposure? Yeah. Way of avoiding it. They're, they're reassured. They're giving themselves reassurance. That this it's is not real. This is not real. This is yeah. not real. Yeah. And I would say, yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. So we can go for the worst. Let's really make fun of it. Would I, in the end use your strategy? I would say, oh, that sounds lovely. I haven't seen that. Let's try it. Let's do it really, really, really bad. And if you still see if you still won't feel anything, challenge them. That's something I'm more used to. But I have to admit that um, there is a small group, but it's definitely there that will not do the exposure. They will avoid. And it's a bigger group than you have with exposure in vivo, in, in real exposure, because it's simply easier to get someone up on a, in a situation. Then our, unsere Gedanken sind frei. Our thoughts are ours, fluent, open. And if you don't dare to do, you don't dare to do. Whereas I can talk to a patient, ask him, may I bodily hold you in the situation you're afraid of? We've done that where I've been trained. Only if the patients before said, that's fine. And then I can help them to stay there. And usually it's not necessary, but I can't do that with the thoughts. And I think that's one of the reasons why in the end, also all, um, most of the disorders that come with a heavy rumination, worrying, post-event processing, or OCD, those that have mostly thoughts, if you look at the numbers, we are not as good at treating them than those that have actions. So we are much better in treating the actions than the thought problems. And that's partly because it's harder to get up, it's partly it's because it's more, more automatic. We simply have less grip on what we think. Okay, homework is, as I said, for, um, for two or three days, not every day because no one does it and it's like diet, then I haven't done a day that I should have, then I don't have to do it the next day either. So pick a realistic goal, you know, um, because otherwise people won't do it. And, and take some time to talk about when are days, when do you have time, really time, set the time apart. And I give them records where they record how anxious they were before they did it, what was the maximum anxiety, why they did it, of emotion, whatever is in there, and afterwards. So that we have a protocol that also helps homework adherence if you, they have to write it down, and then we can talk about it the next time. And it usually is the repetition, and some things can be also almost comically. I know, and that was, she had a bit of GAD, I had a, a patient, but it was actually more about trauma. I had a patient who had a really traumatic experience while being pregnant in the hospital. And she was very avoidant anyway, so we did, an, I prepared with her an, 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 a rehash about the situation in the hospital. And then she came back and she said, you know, it was so strange because after I did it three times, it wasn't so bad anymore, and so actually, I put on the music that we were playing that year. Made it a bit worse, but it still wasn't so bad. She was kind, she couldn't believe that it really got better. And funnily, by herself, tried to make it worse again. She really got, in a way, she really got the idea 
but she hadn't got it before we talked about the homework, so I didn't do such a good job. But I thought it was so funny that she said, you know, it really was better. And now can think about this hospital. Couldn't believe it, so I put on the mu music, you know. She automatically did the right thing. Okay. Ah, oh, yeah. And one point that might be interesting, we are talking about all this imagery, but it is imagery about things you have not encountered or not seen, and so you need a skill for that. And the imagery is, uh, is a skill that we all have more or less. There's a normal distribution. Some of us are very good. Who of you reads a book and sees a movie automatically in their head? Probably the same persons as me, I can never then watch the movie later on, a real movie, because they all look wrong, get totally upset, so there are the downsides to that, you know. And there are others that read books, and it's still a wonderful experience, but they don't see the pictures. So it's, it's really normally distributed. But it is a skill you can train to a certain amount. You come, as with most things, you come with a certain ability, but it's trainable. So if you have a patient, and there are also questions for that, if you, but actually just asking is usually fine. Like, do you see pictures? If you read book, can you imagine something? Some can't do it or have a hard time. And then it can be very nice to do an imagination training. I'd like to show you one step. And we can do it all together, what's kind of nice. So if you would, all of you, sit comfortably and close your eyes. Okay, and now imagine that you are at home in your favorite place, wherever this might be, and look around. What can you see? Is your room that you see tidy or untidy? What what kind of light is there? Is it evening or morning? Artificial light? Daylight? Take your time to look at that. And while you sit there, imagine that you take your hand and you touch the thing you're sitting or lying on. How does it feel? Smooth or rough? Cool or warm? Try to concentrate on the feeling under your hand. Concentrate how it feels to be holed up by chair or sofa or wherever you are. Take a moment to feel your body. Are you relaxed at home? Are the limbs heavy or light? You can take a deep breath and maybe just enjoy that you are at home, the place you like. And now you get up because you're getting thirsty and you go to the kitchen and you get yourself a glass. Feel the glass in your hand, the coolness, smoothness, the weight. Look at the glass. What does it look like? What does the light do to the glass? And you go and fill it with water. Listen. Listen how the water gets into the glass. And now you take that glass to your lips, and you take a sip, you swallow, and you can feel how the water rins down your throat, cool and pleasant. Okay, sorry for a short demonstration, that was it already. <laughs> Uh, was there anyone who had problems imagining the scene? Yeah? I 
I kept going to different rooms in my house. Like choose, I had trouble choosing which one I felt. Was the most comfortable one. Yeah. So if you do that, I mean, I now did it with the whole room without having any information on where you are or what you do. And for most, it worked pretty fine. And that was really handicapping myself. Would I do that training with a single person? I would ask, what's your favorite place? What does it look like? So I would have more information. But what you can see is that most of us can imagine something they know very well, very nicely, if they are not threatened. But it gives you a nice idea and flavor of it. I also already had response and stimulus script in there. For example, at the end where you swallow the water, you feel it in your throat. It's a non-threatening internal stimulus and you can imagine it. So that might make you more believable that you can also experience those other things. And you can also see that a lot of things can be done by questions. You can use that also for your scripts. I said, like looking around, what do you see? You do not before have to write everything down, what the scene on office looks like. You can also simply work with look around. What do you see? What do you feel? If you go there, is there daylight or is it, is it night? It creates an atmosphere, you know, those kind of questions. And um, so really, I had to do it here because otherwise I've lost you all because I don't know your homes. But it's also something that generally works very nicely. Those kind of things, practicing to see things that you are used to, to practicing to see something that you have not seen before, yeah, that are non-threatening, or looking at roses and smelling at roses, those are kind of things train imagery and can be a nice way to do it. To, if, you have to, if you have someone who has difficulties doing it, do a session with just those trainings. And um, I admit the, the best in that are the English. They have a nice history of imagery training in cognitive psychology. Some would probably be able to tell you more about it. Yeah. But it gives you an idea, huh? and so you can, uh, can individualize it. And that's something you might have to do. OK, you conduct the exposure. Um, I think I'm a bit too fast. Let me see if this is really... Yeah. OK. Usually, we do two to three scenarios and not more. Because GAD is comorbid, don't forget it. There's usually a lot of other stuff you can also have to do and you don't have years and years and years. Okay, so you write one with them. You probably pick as the next one one of the worst ones, if it's going well. And then you ask them to write the third one themselves and bring it in and do it with you. And the idea is that they learn how to write their own scenarios. And you might have to spend a bit of time on this scenarios, but you probably will not do exposure together, but actually talk with them about how to write it, how it then worked at home. So you get more and more distance, they become more and more um, skilled in doing that themselves. This is the goal of therapy. So it's not session and session and session of exposure, but it's actually those kind of things. Yeah? Uh, do you wrap the three scenes before they do any exposure? Or is it first scene, exposure, and then back? First scene, second, yeah, because you always get better. It would be a pity to write through the three scenes and then you know, of the first one, you know so much more how someone works and what works for him. No, no, after, after each other. And then they write it themselves. Um, I have to admit that we are right now working on a new format. And I'm just giving it as ideas, but it has not been tested yet. And since this is recorded, I'm not taking any guarantee. But things that seem to work and what we would like to do is uh, short movie clips. You can also show people really, there are really so many nasty movies about being homeless, about kids dying, about kids being ill. And not the whole movie, but just those clips. I'm starting to get a whole, I have a whole list of clips that should work very nicely for GAD. And I've worked a little bit with it. Also works very nicely, just watch movies again and again. 
it's a little bit less in your head and you know what how bad movies can be. Yeah? Sophie's Choice, it's always our movie, our mood induction, I have to admit, for our students. So that can be another way you, to do the exposure. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, and something um, we do with very with a lot of success in PTSD is drawing the trauma and there we have tested it. So um, Agnes van Minnen, I'm working together with her on that but she's really the leader. I don't want to take any too much credit, it's so much fun. Um, we, they have the patients in for a whole week, um, six hours every day and over, every two hours the um, therapist changes and does exposure, but different ways. One is the cl classical e exposure in, uh, in Zensu, one is drawing and one is some kind of in vivo exposure or some cognitive part in there. So drawing works just lovely. So they ask people to draw the worst moment of the PTSD and I thought, and that's something I'm going to try next, we are finalizing the manual in summer and so on. I will do my first patients. I think you can also draw worries. To draw how you are lonely and uh, in bed or crippled or whatever. It's just another way to get into it. So uh, because this exposure in Senso is so very difficult, think about those things. Video clips is pretty safe bet that they will work and they work in everything else. And I've done it with one or two patients and it worked. It gets the emotions going. Um, and drawing might be an, a, a thing as exposure. Again, goal is feel awful, you know, no happy pictures. Um, yeah, so this would be um, the part we do and we usually then add the worry time. So um, they learn how to do it and we tell them save the worry up over the day and maybe just make a note so that you don't forget what you've been worrying about. You can be a bit, little bit paradoxical about that. And at the end of the day you have worry time or if you didn't have a hard time to sleep, let's say at 6 o'clock is your worry time. So probably don't do it exactly before they want to go to sleep. Huh? So set time apart. Um, and then you ask them to, um, to write the, the thing down. And this is from the prevent, pre I should have changed it a bit. This is from the prevention part where you also add some relaxation. I never do it, I don't want them to feel good. And, um, but then do something pleasurable afterwards. That's the classical thing. Um, I usually add, and I'm just going to talk about it, even in GAD you can also do exposure in vivo. As we said, they hate to read the health bulletin, so to speak. Huh? Um, if you think about what those patients really avoid, most of my patients have delegated bills, finances and letters if they have a spouse to a spouse. They don't want to worry about the, the, the mail coming in and what to do with it. They should take that back. You know, let them do that. Um, but a lot of the exposure in vivo is about the safety behavior. Um, they are not allowed to use their mobile anymore. The tracking devices have to be stopped. Uh, and it might be a good idea, and I do it with many of my patients, that I ask children and partners to come for one session and really talk it over with the whole family, new rules. For a while at least, you will not answer the phone if your mom calls. You know. So that gives way less stress. And watch out. Usually the exposure in vivo in GAD can really be done as homework. As others as with GAD, I usually always go along at least for part of the exercise. Here I don't, but, but they can be devious, understandably. So one of my patients, she was so very much worried about her small son. Her small son was 32. Um, the older one, yeah, it was 37, but the small, and she was so happily married, had a steady job, all was fine, but he had always been the child to worry about, so that was her worry child, we say, Sorgenkind. And um, she phoned him every day, 
So, what was the exposure? We said once in the weekend, told also the son because otherwise he thinks something happened with his mother, not phoning anymore. So you will call once. And we had agreed on Sunday she can phone him and otherwise, no. She came in on a Friday and I don't know what, I can be devious too, but I'm probably pure chance. I said, how is your son doing? So I was not asking how is it not to contact your son. I was asking, how is your son doing? She said, oh, he's just fine and this and this. And I said, wait, how do you know he's fine? It's Friday, huh? Oh, oh yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you see, I called his big brother. He's living two houses over. <laughs> so we, she was checking up on him. Um, that's not how it's meant. She was cheating. She was cheating. Sure, she was cheating. But then we all try to cheat so that we don't feel so damn anxious, right? So I do really have empathy for my patients, but it's not how it's supposed to be. Um, all, another classical one is uh, most of them, as I say, very tidy. They only leave the office when everything is done. So you tell them, you will drop your pen and simply go and leave everything how it is. They tend to come half an hour earlier next day to then do what they couldn't do before. So just watch out. Even though it's GAD, even though it's not very obvious what kind of avoidance behavior they do, it's bad enough for them to try to get around. So prepare as well. Um, so look at the situations that might be like bills, like inviting people, like giving presentations. They have those kind of things where they cannot be perfect. Especially look at the reassurance with whom do they talk, all the mobile phone stuff, the things they monitor and plan it. Um, and you, if you do not talk about homework, it will not be done. You know that very simple rule. Um, what I usually do, but I think you, we can skip that. We probably should skip it, but well, we, I'm not so bad with time. It's fine. Um, yeah. Hmm? Slide. Yeah, yeah, that one that I should, yeah. Yeah, just a quick question. You have 45 minutes. Um, generally, I find that um, people will say that they're able to delay the worry and sit down and do it. I, I usually assign mm -hmm. 15 minutes, but that they do not want to worry. Like, they do it, but it doesn't make them feel bad at that point. Oh, yeah. And I t tell them about the stimulus in the response script. Yeah. <laughs> so very visual. So that makes it a bit more efficient. And that's, you know, they really know they should go for the emotion. So what I told them, I t told you, I tell them. Okay, because I'm teaching more as a, a con to control their thinking. Yeah, and that's how it's being done. How is it being done if it's still in the starting phase or not so prominent? Yeah. I know. And, and I wonder how, yeah. And then it might be, I know that some of my colleagues, what they do, because it's t tough to teach her, and if you don't have the time, is to catastrophize. And probably make it even funny, and that's okay. To really go until you're homeless, and until you find the whole situation absurd. So that at least make sure that they think it through to the end. And that might help. Um, they shouldn't do it as a side. What I meant is it's business. Writing very is a serious business. So you don't have to go to an office, but you should have the, the, the mindset of this is not some fun thing I'm doing in front of the TV. This is something I assign time to. Okay. Uh, I, before I do exposure, I shortly talk with my patients about what are the rules of exposure. What I do, and, and we write it down and they take those rules with them. Because the rule is what is a goal of exposure? To feel the emotion. Yes, to feel bad. So what is a sign of a good exposure if I really felt bad? That's one of the most important rules. So not that they go in there, it's just for uh, I have to do it. That's not the aim. The aim is to feel bad, not just doing it and getting out as fast as possible. Yeah? I prefer 
to reformulate it and to say to feel what is to be felt because I think if you say to feel bad, we, well, we, I think we mix yeah. the, the feeling that we want them to feel with a judgment. Yeah. And I think every feeling, I know that we use this word, bad, I feel good, I feel bad, but I think the danger is that we then you introduce a, a, a judgment call on normal feelings. You are totally right. And I'm not very good at it. As you can see also with my lecturing style, I, I like a bit of humor and I like to, po to, to drive the point home. Not the very subtle. And, uh, this is probably very preferable. My personal style is um, the less nice one. But you're right, I totally concede it. And, and I do use humor usually too, so I can, can backfire too. But the only patients I really have problems with if, is if they have really no humor. I once had an OCD patient, young, unwilling to be in therapy with me. I was also much younger, much, much younger, one of my first patients. And um, she was afraid to get AIDS. And she, nothing was funny. The whole life wasn't funny. And I know we were just, we were fighting a lot in a way. Not, not a good example for a good therapist, you know. But then she was sent by her parents and after a while I had the feeling all she wanted was that I tell the parents that this is undoable because she wasn't going to do it. And I after a while got so angry that I thought at least you will take your own responsibility and tell your parents you're not willing to do it. So I offered all the help. Well, we, she never did it, we had to do therapy. And I know that I was taking her to the hospital, the only time I made her laugh, and it really helped our relationship. We took her to hospital, to our university hospital in Dresden. And I said, and I wanted her to touch the table and to eat something. That was the only place there were AIDS patients in Dresden. So she was sitting there like that, you know. Three hours we were sitting there, she still hadn't touched the table because she would die. And there was a cute little child two years old, running around, laughing, touching the floor, touching everything. And I was looking at him and saying, oh, poor child, how old will he get? What do you think with AIDS? Four, five? <laughs> it helped, <laughs> but it was not very subtle either. <laughs> okay, back to the exposures. So you should feel the feelings that you feel and allow the feelings. Uh, and you should only leave if that feelings have gotten, have changed, have lessened, have become less intense. And it doesn't have to be zero. You know, that's not the aim. But you shouldn't go on the height of the feeling. You should go when they have lessened. And usually I'm very good with, I love rating scales, so I say, well, if you, you want a drop of 20 to 30. So if it's from 0 to 100 and you go up to an 80, yeah, if it's 50, that's fine. You know, that I always find it helpful because we have all those different scales. And it's getting late, so I'm getting more anecdotal. One more an anecdote, and I hope my daughter will not get angry. We are both psychologists. And so she's asked my poor child, she's 22, um, what is it like to have two psychologist parents? And then we are also are pretty well known in Germany, so yeah, it comes with the burden. And then my daughter says, oh, it's totally normal, like every other parent. You come home, your mom asks you, how was your day, Sophie? On a scale from zero to 100, and no lying. <laughs> I'm afraid there's more than a kernel of truth there. <laughs> Although rather with my son, he would always say it's fine, fine. And this fine could just scratch, uh, stretch from was an awful day to that was the best day of my life, so to speak. So a rating scale was very helpful there. Okay, so rules for exposure, back, concentrate. Rules for exposure. Get intensive feeling, don't get out when they are on the peak. That also means plan enough time. If you f get out, if you have, when you shouldn't have, don't get 
angry with yourself because it simply happens. We cannot always do it, but try to get back in as fast as possible. You know? Don't make too big a deal out of it if someone can't do it. Just say it happens to the best of us, to all of us. We cannot always do it, but try to do it again. And um, something we Germans are very bad with, no idea if the Israelis are better. If you've done it, reward yourself. You've done something great. Have a nice coffee somewhere, have a tea, pet yourself. A little shopping spree if it was really bad, whatever. Do something to reward yourself. But mostly we all think that we have not earned our reward because everyone else can do it and so if we can finally do it, it has not been something special. And it's really a pity. We should take the time to be, him, to be proud and reward ourselves. Okay. Okay, I've promised, I've heard that some really want to know a bit more about applied relaxation. Yes, yes, yes. I'm waiting for it. <laughs> then we have to skip that, unfortunately. Yeah. This is a case study and a very nicely vague case study and all I would have wanted you to do is to come up with examples how you can do exposure in vivo. In senso is easy, but in vivo. And, um, but maybe, very quickly, make it as a group thing. So, we have someone that has GAD. Um, So, what is she? Um, she worries a lot about her children uh, and has some conflict with her husband because he thinks she's over careful and should pull herself together. She's also worried they might become anxious because she's so anxious. Uh, she doesn't want to harm them under, under circumstances and worries about harmful influence, but also loves them and really monitors them a lot. So let that suffice. Um, and she is, I just tell you about her, she is a teacher and she also worries excessively about not being prepared, going unprepared to work, um, not doing a good job there because she's so poorly um, concentrated. So if you think about those two areas, do you have any idea what you could do in vivo, worrying about the child over, over monitoring? I'm open for suggestions. What, what kind of over monitoring does she do? Um, the kids cannot stay somewhere else overnight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can send her off for a weekend without the kids or send the weekends off or take them to adventures. So that's are the kind of things you have to think about with GAD. Get them out of their comfort zone. Get the kids out of the comfort zone, but especially the mother. Let her go on travel by herself. Let her go to work unprepared. Let her go and prepare a different subject than she is going supposed to teach. That usually works better than going not prepared put all the effort in a subject she cannot teach anyway because otherwise she will sneak things in and then she goes and is unprepared. Okay, everyone is tired and done with it. So I propose a 10 minute break just to get you with coffee and air and then we move on to the applied relaxation. <laughs>